This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Energy is the ultimate bottleneck when it comes to exploring space. On Earth, we have an abundance of energy, from fossil fuels, the sun and wind, and hydropower. But in space, only solar is available. And that fades with the square of the distance, meaning that our range for powered space flight is pretty limited. Beyond a certain point, the size of panels required is far too large to be practical. What we need is a supremely dense source of energy, which can only be found bound within atoms forged in neutron star collisions. Fission energy or elemental energy is the excess energy released when a heavy atom with high binding energy splits into smaller atoms with lower binding energies. It is the most recently discovered of all our energy sources and is also the most unintuitive. Biological beings largely do not interact with nuclear energy in the absence of technology. As such, the energy within the atom is a pathway to powers that some consider unnatural. A great example of the comparison between chemical and nuclear energy is this image. The pellets the man is holding in this photo are the equivalent of 4,000 gallons of petroleum. NASA has already used radioactive isotopes to power missions like Voyager and Curiosity, something known as an RTG, which works on the principle of thermoelectric couples. But a larger design is in the offing, which may help humanity go to the moon and beyond, and possibly stay a while. Today, we're going to talk about Every commercial reactor today works by boiling water to create steam, which then turns a turbine. This converts the heat output of the reactor into electricity at an efficiency of 30 to 40 percent. So nuclear is definitely very steampunk. The RTGs in Voyager, Galileo, Cassini, New Horizon and Curiosity also convert heat to electricity, albeit at much lower efficiency, only able to provide around 100 watts of power from the radioactive decay of plutonium-238. But of course, in a much more compact form factor due to the lack of water, steam and turbines. Those are hard to work with in space. The kilopower reactor uses a different conversion technology called a Stirling engine, which converts heat to mechanical energy that in turn can be turned into electricity by the spinny thing. And before we find out exactly how it works, here's a quick word from our sponsor. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing and more. It can help you make 2022 a year of new learning, growth and connection through creativity. Whether you're a dabbler or a pro, a hobbyist or a master, Skillshare is for you. We discover what you can make with classes for every skill level. I'm going through the ultimate self-care playbook. Discover and Nurture Your Centered Self by Jonathan Van Ness. It has given me a set of simple and practical tools to tune into my needs and be the best version of myself. Each lesson is packed with stories, examples, and hands-on demos which will give you concrete tools to strengthen the most important relationship in your life. Your relationship with yourself. You'll have a fun, flexible framework that'll help you develop the strength to navigate life's many challenges. The first thousand people to use the link in the description below will get one month free trial from Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. The reactor consists of a metallic uranium core that is 6 inches or 15 centimeters in diameter with a beryllium oxide reflector that surrounds the uranium core. For a given mass of uranium to go critical, it needs each fission event to lead to exactly one more fission. And for fission to occur, you need enough neutrons. A decent number of neutrons circulating inside the core means the neutron economy is good. In terms of current affairs, you can think of neutrons as the natural gas of the nuclear economy. If its supply diminishes, the economy starts shutting down. Beryllium is a great neutron reflector because it really doesn't like absorbing neutrons, preferring to scatter them instead. When it surrounds the core, it is able to prevent a lot of neutrons from escaping the core. On the other side of the spectrum is the control rod made of boron carbide. Boron-10 absolutely loves gobbling up neutrons because it has an extremely stable isotope to transform into, boron-11. So it absolutely crashes the neutron economy, shutting down any fission events by eating up the neutrons before they have a chance to cause fission. So the control rod is used as an on and off switch for the reactor. When it's inserted into the core, the reactor is off. When it's withdrawn, it turns on. For reactors like kilopower, the off position will be maintained. 
until it's transported to where it's needed. And only then will a small battery be used to withdraw it, initiating criticality. Just to make things a little easier to understand, the oxide in beryllium oxide and carbide in boron carbide are just to set the physical properties of the material. They do not interact with the nuclear process in a meaningful way. It just so happens that these compounds have really high melting points, which helps in making the reactor safe. Now that we've got fission happening, we need to take the heat energy to the hot side of the Stirling engine. This is done via heat pipes. The heat pipes are sealed tubes containing sodium. At the hot end close to the core, the sodium evaporates and travels to the cool end. There, since the temperature is lower, it condenses and is transported back to the hot end through a wick. One key property of this setup is that it doesn't need gravity to work, which is kind of important out in space and it works against gravity as well. We've discussed heat pipes before with Oklo. It is a fast reactor like this one and uses many of the same principles. Go check out the technology if you haven't already. The heat pipe ultimately delivers the heat to a set of eight Stirling engines, which convert it to electricity. The cool end is maintained at a low temperature through the use of a radiator, which maintains a temperature differential between the hot end and the cool end. It converts heat to electricity at an excellent efficiency of 25%. That's four times higher than the RTGs we talked about earlier. It can apparently last decades, with the Stirling engines expected to fail way before the core runs out of steam. I mean, nuclear, before the core runs out of nuclear. The core, by the way, is highly enriched uranium. So containing 93% uranium-235 by mass. The same as what is used in nuclear submarines. The kilopower reactor uses well-established physics, as opposed to speculative physics, which eliminates the need for complex control systems. The heat pipes themselves are passive, with no pumps or valves, reducing many points of failure. And the reactor has a negative temperature coefficient of reactivity, meaning that when the amount of energy pulled from it is less, it heats up and expands, causing fewer fissions to occur. Nuclear waste is something that is very important to discuss whenever we talk about a novel nuclear reactor of this sort. When uranium splits, it's going to create nuclear fission products that will be screamingly radioactive, giving off beta particles and gamma rays as they undergo beta decay in an attempt to claw their way to stability. The main risk in a reactor is once fission begins. So the main safety feature is to keep the reactor off during launch. Only when it has reached its final location will it be turned on and only then will fission products be produced. For even the higher spec 10 kilowatts, once the reactor is shut down, the decay heat will be around 450 watts. This is low enough that it can be radiated into space without raising the temperature enough to melt the core. Now, lunar night lasts two weeks, so you need an energy source during that time. Mars gets enough sun, but it experiences dust storms that can last up to two years. So even close to the sun, solar doesn't always work. Jupiter, Saturn, and your planets further out cannot be reached through solar and need some form of nuclear technology. So essentially, all deep space missions can vastly benefit from having more power available. For instance, you could use this power for propulsion to send a probe to Pluto and have the ability to slow it down to put it into orbit around the dwarf planet instead of just a flyby like we did with the New Horizons spacecraft. These reactors can also be put on Mars to create oxygen and fuel in preparation for a human mission some years down the line. Energy is life, and in the vast emptiness of space, these reactors can be bonfires for human beings as we push the frontiers of manned exploration. So there you have it. A new reactor design that's way past the drawing board has been successfully tested and has specific niche applications that few other energy sources can fulfill. At a time when nuclear power seems to be finally getting its day in the sun, it is interesting to see how vital it can be to things that are beyond just utilitarian. You may have heard of kilopower before, but there is a great new interview with Patrick McClure and David Poston, the two people behind the development of kilopower, on atomicinsights.com. This is the website maintained by Rod Adams and has several great podcasts about nuclear technology that you should check out if you're interested in nuclear energy and the people working behind the scenes. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring it. Like, share, subscribe and start a conversation below to get more videos like this in your recommendations. I'll see you really soon. Bye.